Hi, I'm Dave Ehrenberg, state attorney for Palm Beach County, aka the Florida Lawman, here on True Crime MTN. And I'm joined today by the great attorney, Rich Schoenstein. You've seen him on TV talking true crime, and he's here with us on True Crime MTN. Rich, great to have you back, my friend. Always good to be here, Dave. How you doing? I'm good. And if it's Rich Schoenstein time, that means it's Karen Reed time. Because Rich has been following this case closely. He's done a bunch of videos on them. I encourage you to check them out and to keep liking our videos, keep subscribing, keep sharing with a friend. We're heading towards 50,000 subs, so thank you for that. As far as the Karen Reed case, well, you and I predicted this is a way it would end, and we took a lot of grief from folks in the Karen Reed camp who could not even imagine that the jury would take more than five minutes to acquit her because, after all, there was a conspiracy so immense, conspiracy of silence from the law enforcement officers inside the house, even though it was, wasn't just law enforcement, even though they weren't from the same agency, even though they really didn't have too much of an ax to grind with uh, the victim, O'Keefe, in this case, and even though you'd have to believe that they killed him, and then instead of just claiming self-defense, which would have been too easy, or burying his body somewhere out of sight, out of mind. They throw him on the front lawn, and then they plant evidence to frame poor Karen Reed, who, by the way, had told her lawyer she hit her boyfriend. She told everyone then she had hit him, I hit him, I hit him afterwards. She called her friend up at 5 a.m. to say, uh, John's dead. So yeah, uh, aside from all that other stuff, this was a perfect conspiracy. And in the end, I think the defense bit off more than they could chew. They have reasonable doubt here. You can make that case all day long. Law enforcement messed up. Uh, there could be a bunch of reasonable doubt here, but as far as a conspiracy to buy all the things I've already mentioned, fat chance. Rich, what do you think? Well, Dave, I, you know, I go back to the first conversations we had about this case, and we said two things that both proved to be true. One is we weren't, we didn't understand why the defense was going after this conspiracy claim, which seemed to be a stretch and which in a way shifted the burden to the defense. Now, stop leaving me comments that say the prosecution has the burden of proof. I know that. I actually <laughs> learned that in law school, okay? I know that. They have the proof. But when the defense stood up and said Karen Reed was framed, in the eyes of the jury, they made this case a binary decision. Either she's guilty or she was framed. That's what they did. That's how they cast the case, and it put the burden on them. They didn't need to do that. They had such good, reasonable doubt arguments. And the second thing you and I said right from the outset, we didn't really love the way the prosecution was presenting this case. And, and that may have been the reason they didn't get a unanimous guilty verdict. Well, true. I think that Lally did an admirable job of doing this all himself. Remember, he was up against right. some real high-powered right. lawyers, right? And Lolly, as a, as a sitting state attorney, it's very rare to have any of my prosecutors try a case alone. Almost always they have someone sitting second chair with them. Here, not only did he try it alone, he did the most important high-profile case of that community's lifetime by himself. And he almost got a conviction. Well, we actually don't know because we don't know what the vote count was. And, and yeah. the uh, prosecutor said that he, the DA says is going to retry the case. Um, so they must know what the vote count was because I don't think they would retry the case if it was 11-1 in the opposite direction. Uh, but the fact that despite having a proctor who was a terrible witness, who led the investigation, who wrote the most har hurtful, disgusting text messages and he was awful on the stand. And despite the fact that there was a battle of experts, well, this couldn't happen, this happened, this test occurred, this didn't. Yeah, uh, despite all that, he was almost able to get a conviction here. And I think that is telling, that tells you exactly what you're saying, Rich, that despite the existence of reasonable doubt here, the jury said, well, it's a binary choice. It's a binary choice because the defense assumed that burden, assumed the burden to say, you have to believe that this is a conspiracy. And that conspiracy was so outlandish. In addition to everything I've already said, how do you explain all the little pieces of taillight inside uh, the victim's clothing? How do you explain that? Unless all of it was planted. Yes, they planted all those little microscopic pieces of taillight inside his clothing, just like the hair and the DNA and the straw. Oh, yes. No, that didn't happen, okay? Uh, you can have reasonable doubt 
and you can have a lack of a conspiracy. And just look at Proctor. You hate Proctor, don't you guys? But did you see one text message that talked about a cover-up conspiracy planting evidence? No. You saw stupid texts, offensive texts. You saw that he wanted to protect the people in the house, perhaps. Yeah. But did you see any evidence of planting evidence or having this whole conspiracy of silence? No, you didn't. Yeah, and, and so a couple things in reaction to that. One is we don't know the count. We Nobody knows the jury count, but we do know this, that in the last couple of days of deliberation, the defense wanted to take the hung jury and the prosecution wanted to keep pushing forward with deliberations, which suggests to me the prosecution thought they might get a guilty verdict if they kept going. At least that's what they thought. And you're right about everything Lally had to deal with. But the biggest thing he had to deal with is the terrible police work that was done in Massachusetts. Now, would you like to hear my theory of what actually happened in this case? Please. Okay. Here's what I think. Because I don't buy the conspiracy either. Here's what I think. Proctor shows up at the crime scene and he immediately concludes that Karen Reed hit the guy with her car. Immediately. He thinks it's an open and shut case. And he knows there are police officers in the house. He doesn't want to bother them. Not because there's a conspiracy, not because they're doing something illegal. He just doesn't want to bother the police. So he thinks it's open and shut. He's on the phone texting with his friend, texting with his wife. He's sending those horrible texts. He's concluded what's happened here. He's biased. And then at some point, as this goes forward, he realizes that he actually needs evidence. <laughs> and, and so some of what you see, which is, well, why are they interviewing people now, you know, weeks later? Why are they doing this? Why are we doing that? Is because he, he realizes he's got to put this case together. And that's what he did. And was that a proper way to do an investigation? No. You wouldn't stand for it, Dave, if you were if you were overseeing that. That that was improper, and he's he's suffering some consequences right now. I believe we'll see how much consequence he suffers, but that's what I think happened. I think that I think that he made a snap judgment and then had to scramble to support it, which is different from a conspiracy. Yeah, fair point. Uh, I I think that the prosecution was unfairly saddled with Proctor. I think that they could have done a better job uh, taking out the sting early on by describing in more detail what kind of a terrible investigation that Proctor did and how offensive his texts are. So it wasn't so surprising when all that stuff came out. Uh, and perhaps they should have convinced law enforcement to let Proctor go before the trial so that Leah could at least say, yeah, I, we were offended too. He's gone. Uh, but instead, the prosecution was tied to Proctor throughout because not only was he still the key witness, he still was in charge of the investigation through the trial. He was never removed from his duties until after it was over. Once the trial began, you couldn't do it. But I think the prosecution could have benefited from being able to tell the jury that, yeah, he's no longer in charge. Here's the new guy in charge. And uh, that would have not only given... I think the state a better look, but also would allow prosecutors to say, we are not Proctor. We are separate. We're a separate pair of eyes. We don't like what he did. In fact, he's no longer with us anymore. So they didn't do any of that. And that hurt Lolly's case. Do you think, do you think they'll really retry it? I mean, the prosecutors say they intend, use the intend word. I intend to do a lot of things. Do you think they'll do it? Depending on the vote count. You, you said that no one knows the yeah. vote count. I gotta believe that Lolly either either has an inkling of it, perhaps they do know, maybe someone's talked to them about it. Uh, but if they do not have a good vote count, if the vote count is 10-2 against them, if it was 11-1 against them, then I do not think they will retry it. But I see the reason why I say that he was close to a conviction was exactly what you said, was that towards the end, the prosecution was sitting there hoping for a conviction. They were expecting either that or a hung jury, whereas the defense was like, all right, let's take that hung jury and get out of Dodge. Um, right. well, I, I, could also, I could also posit, Dave, that maybe Lally just wanted this case to be over one way or another. And he was like, just give me a verdict. I don't care what it is. I just want this case to be done. I'm not sure he relishes the idea of retrying it. Well, it's this case is not uh, over because you have the, the retrial if it happens, but also you have 
Turtle Boy is facing consequences. We're going to have to do some videos on that where he's going to trial soon enough on all those felony counts of obstruction and intimidation of witnesses, all that other stuff that he was being charged with. What's your take on that? Well, I don't know. So listen, I, I there's so much acrimony between the people who believe Karen Reed is guilty and the people who uh, believe she isn't and or believe there's a conspiracy. There's, um, there's allegations against each other. Turtle Boy is now saying that the other day somebody hung a turtle on his parents' lawn or something like that to try to intimidate him. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but and if it's true, is that something that was an inside job? Talk about conspiracy theory, you know, to right. gain sympathy, right? I, right. I've right. I've seen people yeah. talking about that too. I, I don't know. I I I don't know. I mean, in some way, I think he is the Alex Jones of the Karen Reed case. Um, he's built a little media empire based on his involvement in this case. He said last week he's getting a movie deal to tell his story which by the way, that might be of interest to anybody who thinks they have a civil claim against him, but was worried it wouldn't be collectible. Mm. Maybe he does have some assets coming. So, and, and actually, and one other thing I wanna say on that, uh, put Turtle Boy aside for a minute, there might be lots of civil litigation, right? There could be litigation against Karen Reed by O'Keefe survivors, and there could be also, there was been so much hurled in both directions. I'm not going to be at all surprised to see some defamation lawsuits out there one way or the other or both. Yeah. And you're seeing pictures out there now, which I don't know if they're real or not. The New York Post had the pictures of Karen Reed uh, with her attorneys. And I, I, I don't, you know, at this point, I don't know what's real, what's fake about the canoodling with your attorneys. So I, I don't, I, I just, I, I, I don't care. I, I'm just going to say it. I don't care. You know what? If you if you did a trial for three months and you were out at the end of that trial with your client and everybody had a few drinks, I, I don't really care. Uh, you know, I don't care. Well, <laughs> can I say that clear? <laughs> for the record, Rich Sowenstein does not care about I that part. A I lot of people care, uh, but I, I get it from a legal standpoint. You know, I, I who knows and and. Uh, it's just worth mentioning because people are talking about it. And again, I don't know if it's real or not, uh, but right. this case is not going away. And we'll be here to cover it on True Crime MTN. Uh, see, we got through this whole thing without totally gloating because we got a lot of help from people who said, you know, this is such an easy case. You guys are dopes. Well, it looks like the jury agreed more with us than uh, than people expected. Uh, we'll hopefully see the, the count soon enough. And look, if it's 11-1 against the state, which I don't believe it, but if it is, we'll be back here to take our lumps. But I think uh, this this case was a lot stronger than many people thought. And these conspiracies out there, come on, guys. I mean, you know, they, they only go too far. In a court of law, you know, in a court of public opinion, the conspiracy theories can spread like wildfire. But in a court of law, they fizzle. That's right. It's different. What played well on social media wouldn't necessarily play well to a jury of 12 people sitting in a jury box. And, and one other thing I want to say with that I haven't said yet about that on the conspiracy theory, they cross-examined all of the Alberts and all of the McCabe's. I thought most of those witnesses did pretty well. You know, Karen Reed didn't testify, which is absolutely her constitutional right, which was absolutely the right decision. But it's hard to say all of the other witnesses were lying when you don't even get on the witness stand. Oh, that is such a great point, Rich, because when I mentioned in a couple of different podcasts where Karen Reed didn't take the stand, and so all those people who believe in this conspiracy theory, how do you explain that? And and then the criminal defense lawyer on the other side of the interview says, how dare you? How yeah. dare you mock her for her constitutional rights? I'm not saying this in a courtroom. She has every right not to take the stand. I'm just saying, if you believe there's this conspiracy, then how come Every other person, every person supposedly involved in the conspiracy from Brian Albert, Jen McCabe, everyone took the stand and testified under oath. The only person who didn't was Karen Reed. Yep. That's a problem. That's a problem with that defense. And if you make the defense simpler and just challenge reasonable doubt and don't have her testify, I think that works better. We'll see if we see it yep. in the next trial. And, and you know, it, it is also telling that Karen Reed spoke a lot about this case, more than I've ever seen any defendant in any case ever 
talk about this case on the way to and from the courthouse, but not in front of the jury on the stand under oath. So that is what it is. All right, sir. Thank Word you, my come. friend. All right, so we're going to end this here. I'm Dave Ehrenberg, AK the Florida Lawman. That's Rich Schoenstein. Rich, tell them how they can find you. Just find me at Lawful Riches on the social media. My law firm is Tartar, Krinsky, and Drogan in New York City. You can find me there, too. All right. Hey, thank you for watching. We really appreciate you. Again, I'm Dave Ehrenberg, and this is True Crime MTN. Like us, subscribe, share with a friend, and leave a comment below. Yes, even if you disagree with us, and we'll see you next time.